describe how many dissolutions there are for the elements of material nature, and who survives after the dissolution to serve the Lord while he is asleep, purport by Srila Prabhupada. In the Brahma Samhita 547-48, it is said that all the material manifestations with innumerable universes appear and disappear with the breathing of Mahavishnu lying in Yoga Nidra or mystic sleep. Yakarna Yakara Narna Vajale Bajatisma Yoga Nidrama Namda Jagaranda Saroma Kupa Atara Shaktim Avalambya Param Swamurkim Govinda Madi Purisham Tamaham Bachami Govinda, the ultimate and supreme personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna, lies sleeping unlimitedly on the causal ocean in order to create unlimited numbers of universes during that sleep. He lies on the water by his own internal potency, and I worship that original Supreme Godhead. Due to his breathing, innumerable universes come into existence, and when he withdraws his breath, there occurs the dissolution of all the lords of the universes. That plenary portion of the Supreme Lord is called Mahavishnu, and he is a part and parcel, and he is a part of the part of Lord Krishna. I worship Govinda, the original Lord. After the dissolution of the material manifestation, the Lord and his kingdom beyond the causal ocean do not disappear, nor do the inhabitants, the Lord's associates. The associates of the Lord are far more numerous than the living entities who have forgotten the Lord due to material association. The impersonalist explanation of the uh, word aham in the four verses of the original Bhagavatam Ahameva, Sameva, Dre, etc., is refuted here. The Lord and his eternal associates remain after the dissolution. Vidura's inquiry about such persons is a clear indication of the existence of all of the paraphernalia of the Lord. This is also confirmed in the Kasi Kanda, as quoted by both Jiva Goswami and Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti, who follow in the footsteps of Srila Sridhar Swami. Achavante uh, Hyad Bhakta Mahatyam Pralayapadi Atochu To Kile Loke Sa Ekas Sarva Govyaya. The devotees of the Lord never annihilate their individual existences, even after the dissolution of the entire cosmic manifestation. The Lord and the devotees who associate with Him are always eternal in both the material and the spiritual world. So the translation again. Please describe how many dissolutions there are for the elements of material nature and who survives after the dissolution to serve the Lord while he is asleep. So, this verse deals with the dissolution of the material creation. And of course, in in the purport, Srila Prabhupada refers to the uh, source of the material creation. So, it is explained that the material elements, uh, as we know them, are created uh, and in due course of time, they are destroyed. At the same time, the material energy uh, itself is eternally existing. So the elements as we know them are byproducts of the eternally existing material energy. It is explained in the uh, Bhagavatam uh, that the eternal, uh, uh, eternally existing material energy uh, before the time of the creation is in a state called Pradhan. Uh, in this state, uh, no variegated forms are manifest. Basically, in the uh, Pradhan, you can sort of imagine a uniform 
uh, substance which has no variety and no uh, particular form. So, at the time of the creation, Mahavishnu glances over the material energy and he, uh, through his glance, he introduces the conditioned spirit soul who had been stored up within the body of Mahavishnu and he also injects the uh, karmic programming of those conditioned souls. Uh, and his glance also introduces the uh, element of time, or kala. So, uh, this is material time characterized by past, present, and future. So it's explained that in the spiritual world, uh, material time is not manifest. Uh, material time involves uh, three aspects, basically uh, creation, maintenance, and annihilation. So the very idea that you have past, present, and future, uh, the future is always coming into being, so that's the process of creation. Uh, things are being maintained for some time, and then they're annihilated, so they go into the past and are uh, lost uh, from the point of view of those who are continuing in the present. So that's the process of annihilation. So uh, one of the questions that Vidura is asking Maitreya is to describe how many annihilations there are. So one of the annihilations is the annihilation that is continually occurring due to the uh, effect of material time. So uh, when Mahavishnu introduces material time into the uh, material uh, energy, the material energy begins to undergo different interactions. And as a result of this, the different elements are created. So in the uh, first step, uh, the, uh, well, actually the first step that is described is that the Pradhan becomes known as Mahatattva. Uh, within the Mahatattva, the false ego becomes activated, and within the element of false ego, the three modes of material nature begin to interact. Then it is described that from the uh, mode of goodness, the element of mind is generated. This is material mind, as opposed to spiritual mind. And from the mode of passion, uh, material intelligence and the senses are generated. And from the mode of ignorance, the uh, gross material elements are generated. So it's described that the uh, from uh, false ego in ignorance, there's first the manifestation of sound vibration, uh, shabda. Uh, from this sound vibration, the element of ether, or space, is manifested. And ether is the accommodating room for uh, other gross material manifestations. So, uh, ether is basically empty space. Uh, we think of space as empty, but actually, according to the uh, Vedic understanding, space is a, uh, a plenum that is, it's full of this uh, material substance called ether, or akash. So, there's a further transformation of uh, ether. Uh, the principle of touch is introduced. This is called the Sparsha Tan Matra. So, uh, as soon as you have touch, you have the possibility of objects that can push one another, or interact with one another. So, from touch, the element of air becomes manifest. Uh, and the, then there's a further transformation, and visual form is manifested uh, from the element of air. And then, uh, light and uh, you know, fire, uh, all forms of radiant energy become manifest. Uh, so then there's a further transformation, and you have the uh, sense object of uh, taste and the sense of taste. Uh, these senses, by the way, are apparently being linked in from the creation coming down from the uh, false ego in 
uh, the mode of passion, because it's described that the senses are produced from false ego and passion. But we see that each gross material element links up with the sense. So you have ether being linked with uh, hearing, uh, then uh, air is linked with uh, touch, sense of touch, uh, light and radiant energy, fire, are linked up with the sense of sight, then the uh, water corresponding to the taste uh, tanmatra is linked up with the sense of taste, and then finally there's a further transformation producing uh, aroma or smell, and from this the element of earth is generated, and this is connected with the sense of smell. So this is the description. These elements are not uh, the elements that we directly experience in this world. It is described that uh, we do not have direct experience of the pure elements. Uh, they are to be found, for example, in the shells of the universe. But uh, within the section of the universe where everyone is living, uh, the elements are mixed in different proportions. And there are descriptions uh, in Vedic literature of the uh, uh, proportion in these mixtures. So basically, ether uh, is not pure ether. It is a mixture of ether and also uh, air, fire, water, and earth, but it's predominantly ether. So that element is called ether. And the same is true of the other uh, elements. So this is the process of creation. So. Uh, and this takes place under the influence of the uh, time uh, element. Uh, so, uh, there is also a process of dissolution which reverses the process of creation. So, uh, just as in the process of creation you have the production of uh, ether, air, fire, water, and earth, in the process of dissolution you have earth being absorbed into ether, into uh, water, water into fire, fire into air, air into earth, uh, into ether, excuse me, and uh, then ether into false ego in ignorance, and so on. So everything uh, reverses step by step, and you have the retraction of these elements one into the other. So uh, this process takes place at the time of the final annihilation of the universe. So there are different kinds of uh, annihilation. Uh, the universe is annihilated uh, at the after the complete lifetime of Brahma. So let's see what is that? It comes to some uh, 31 trillion years or something of that nature. One can calculate that from the figures given in the Bhagavatam. So, at the time of the annihilation of the universe, all of the different uh, material elements are retracted one into the other, and one is left again with Pradhan. Uh, the conditioned spirit souls are withdrawn once again into the body of Mahavishnu. And at the time of the creation of further universes, those uh, conditioned spirit souls are again injected into the matrix of uh, the material energy. Uh, so, of course, uh, here the question is given, who survives after the dissolution? So, of course, the conditioned spirit souls survive in the sense that they exist as spirit souls, but they do not continue to have any uh, active life after the dissolution of the universe. They are stored in a state of, uh, you could say, suspended animation within the body of Mahavishnu. Uh, however, beyond the material uh, creation, there is the eternally existing spiritual world, and there are unlimited, uh, liberated living entities in the spiritual world whose lives are not interrupted by the material dissolution. So they have uh, eternal existence in the spiritual world. So, there are a number of other types of dissolutions that occur within the material world. In addition to the final dissolution, there is the dissolution that occurs at the end of one kalpa, or day of Brahma. It's described that it's, uh, at the end of the day of Brahma, the 
planetary systems are annihilated up to, uh, I believe it's Maharaloka. Uh, this is an annihilation which involves fire and then water. Uh, then, uh, so that occurs every, at the end of every kalpa. The length of time given for a kalpa is uh, 4,320,000,000 years. So on a shorter time scale, there are dissolutions that occur at the end of a, uh, the reign of a manu. So there are 14 uh, manus during one kalpa. Uh, and what is it? The time period for each manu, is, I think it's about 307 million years, roughly speaking. Uh, you can calculate that, uh, since it would be basically one fourteenth of the four billion three hundred and twenty million year figure. So, uh, at the end of a Manzantar period, uh, typically there is an annihilation. There is, this is one of the points where there's uh, different statements are made by some of the acharyas. Uh, some have said that. Uh, there's an annihilation after every Manzantar period, and others have said that after some Manzantar period, there's an annihilation. Uh, one example that we have of that is the uh, annihilation that occurred after the period of Chakshusha Man Manzantar. Uh, this is the uh, occasion for the Matsya Avatar. So at that time, there was a great flood which uh, completely uh, flooded the uh, middle planetary system of Bhu Mandala. So, uh, the story there sounds very much like the story of Noah and the Ark in, in the Bible. But uh, you have the, uh, well, the basic story is that uh, a, a great king, who later became uh, Vaivasvata Manu, uh, discovered this fish, very tiny fish, which interestingly enough spoke to him and uh, said, please uh, protect me from being eaten up by these larger fish. So the, uh, the king, this was uh, Shraddha Deva, uh, the king put the fish in a small container to protect it. So the fish then expanded very quickly and said, uh, I'm too large for this container. So the king then put the fish in a larger container. The fish again expanded, and he put the fish in some pond. It again expanded, so he put it in a lake. Uh, so the fish kept expanding and uh, saying, the place where you put me is too small. So finally, the king placed the fish in the ocean and asked uh, who he was, because he determined that this was not an ordinary fish. So this particular fish was an expansion of uh, Lord Vishnu, and uh, the Lord Vishnu informed the king that there was going to be an annihilation. So uh, a boat was provided, and the king and some sages rode out the, the annihilation on this boat, and it's described that the, the fish incarnation of Vishnu known as Matsya, uh, was used to uh, tow the boat through the, the waters of uh, devastation. And it's interesting to consider, by the way, the uh, scale of size that's involved in this story, because it's described as the Matsya avatar finally grew to one million yojanas in length, which would correspond to about eight million miles. So, uh, you can see then that the uh, ocean that he was swimming in was not the ocean of this uh, small Earth globe, because the distance around the equator would be about 25,000 miles. So he was swimming in a much larger ocean. So this was a uh, cosmic annihilation of the entire Bhumandala uh, planetary system. Uh, so this is an example of an annihilation occurring after a uh, Manzantar period. So, uh, the process of creation of the material elements and also their annihilation, uh, interestingly enough, has some analogies to uh, some of the uh, 
Well, there's some parallels between that and some of the speculations of the modern physicists, uh, which is somewhat interesting. The, uh, nowadays, the uh, physicists will say that matter, of course, began, uh, well, with what they call the Big Bang. They have a rather curious uh, theory. But they will say that initially, when matter first appeared, uh, starting with a mathematical singularity uh, in the beginning of time, uh, there was one force within uh, nature. But as the universe expanded and cooled off, a sort of process of condensation occurred. Uh, the technical term for this is symmetry breaking. But it's similar to what happens, for example, when water freezes. Uh, water is uniform. Uh, there's no particular preferred direction within water. But if you cool off water, you'll see ice crystals forming on the surface. And you'll see that the ice crystals have an, uh, an alignment in particular directions. So one patch of ice will have a grain to it that's lined up in one direction. And another patch will have a different grain lined up in a different direction. And these patches grow and then fuse together to form a slab of ice. So the scientists are saying that a similar thing happens when the uh, uh, universe expands. And the result is that different domains are produced in which the forces of nature differentiate into a series of different forces. This is their, their idea. So, uh, it's basically a concept in which you have an original form of energy and you have different transformations of that energy that produce uh, the final forms of matter that uh, we observe today. So, at least on that level, there's an analogy between the uh, scientific ideas and the idea of the creation. Because in the creation of the elements, you have successive transformations starting with an initial uh, element. Uh, actually, uh, another feature of the Big Bang Theory is that initially there's no variegated form. Uh, the result of the condensation process is that the one force, undifferentiated, the undifferentiated oneness that you start with, uh, breaks down into a series of differentiated forces. And then further condensation occurs, and you have uh, the formation of uh, atoms, and then galaxies, and so on and so forth. At least this is their idea. Uh, so you do, in this sense, uh, have a parallel between that and the Vedic concept, because in the Vedic concept, the Pradhan also is in a state of oneness. There's no variety there. But you then have varieties of elements being manifest. And once the elements have been created, then further variety is manifest by the agency of Mahavishnu. And very complicated material forms are generated within the material universe. Of course, uh, the difference between the scientific model and the Vedic model, there are many differences, but one uh, very important difference is that in the scientific model, the entire process occurs without any intelligent control, whereas according to the Vedic model, everything is occurring under the intelligent control of Mahavishnu. Now, this is a, uh, a very important difference. The uh, model given by the scientists runs into severe difficulties when it comes to explaining the origin of uh, very complex uh, structures, such as the bodies of living organisms. Uh, they will invoke some idea of, dis of evolution, according to which material atoms just bumping into one another uh, form compounds which react chemically and eventually create living cells. Uh, this is quite a, uh, a problem, though, because there's a tremendous gap between uh, chemicals that will form under natural circumstances through ordinary chemical reactions and the formation of a complete living cell. Uh, so this 
gap has been has not been filled, although the scientists typically will just wave their hands and say, well, some evolutionary process uh, will bridge this gap, uh, and we'll figure out someday how it works. This, of course, is the uh, procedure known as promissory materialism. Uh, there was a philosopher named Karl Popper who utilized uh, that particular term. Uh, Shula Prabhupada has referred to the same thing as the uh, uh, post-dated check. You're given a post-dated uh, check in this particular uh, area of explaining the creation. So, uh, by the way, there are some uh, other parallels between this process of creation and uh, physics that are somewhat interesting. Uh, in the Vedic uh, conception, it is explained that gross matter is generated from ether. So some kind of transformation occurs in ether to produce the gross material element. But uh, in physics, there is a uh, theory called geometrodynamics, which purports to explain how matter can be produced from uh, space. Uh, the way to understand that is to imagine a two-dimensional model in which space is a kind of flexible sheet, like a uh, sheet of rubber. So, you can imagine, um, well, let's see, the way to do it is you cut uh, two holes in the sheet of rubber, let's say, and then you draw up one of them to form a tube, bend that over, and connect the tube to the other hole. So basically, you've added a handle uh, by bending and reconnecting the, the rubber sheet. And in their theory, the, the two places where this handle links up with the sheet correspond to a particle and an antiparticle. So in this way, you can produce particles just by uh, bending this sheet and stitching it, cutting it and stitching it in different ways. So the sheet corresponds to space, so according to this theory, then matter is made up of space. So that's at least analogous to the idea that um, ether can give rise to the gross element. Of course, it's a very rough analogy. So, uh, there's a few observations about the um, dissolution of the material element. Are there any uh, questions? Yeah. The other way around. For sound to do the very easy concept. Yeah. But sound is considered the highest, the most trouble, you know, within the material world and all and the other sound is all for the meaning by which one can be elevated, yet it's being produced from ignorance. So can you just comment on that feeling, you know, that kind of thing? Well, this, of course, is material sound vibration, and it is the precursor of the gross material element. So, I don't think that what is referred to here is transcendental sound. Or even just the sound of the gross... Um, yes, you can see that sound, in this sense, is considered to be the subtlest aspect of the gross element. And it's coming from ignorance, where you would think it will probably come from goodness. Well, you see, you have some other things that are also being produced. There's also mind and intelligence. So it turns out that mind is being produced from uh, false ego and the mode of goodness, which may seem strange because the mind can create problems for a person if the mind is not controlled. Uh, but that's the, the situation. Of course, the gross elements I suppose, fit in nicely with the idea of ignorance, since they're gross and inert. Yeah? In the dissolution and reversal of the elements that you were describing, do we have any that in this level, or is it like the creation, that it's just pure elements and we have no perception of that? Um, 
No, I don't believe we have any direct experience with the dissolution of the, the elements. At least, uh, I don't know any description in the Vedic literature indicating that that dissolution occurs um, during the, the course of the um, uh, maintenance of the universal manifestation. Of course, you'll find many cases in which a great soul who is uh, leaving his body will speak of uh, merging the different elements one into the other. Um, so, however, that seems to be, as far as I can understand, an expression of his uh, indifference to those elements or his withdrawal of attachment from them. That is, you merge the earth into the total reservoir of earth and so on and so forth. It doesn't mean that the earth in his body is actually annihilated or anything like that. So, well, the, there are different manifestations of the spiritual world within the material world. So, Swayed Leaf would be one, for sure. Uh, Vrindavan is another example. Uh, and, of course, uh, Navadvip, Dham, and so on. So when the material elements are annihilated, these transcendental domains remain as they are. So, uh, but there's no problem there because although they're in the same place, they're also different. So that place, that place, yeah, this refers again to the point I've made from time to time concerning higher dimensions. I don't think you can define the coordinates of all of these things using just X, Y, and Z. That is, three-dimensional coordinates. But you have to have a higher kind of coordinates in order to uh, explain these things. Yeah? Why is the they are not formed the they are not formed in the they are not in the they are the they the they are 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 the what, what was that? I didn't hear that. They compare to like a probe. A probe? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> when that dry, you can see it has different shapes and mm-hmm. So they actually compare like water or like that. In other words, they're trying to justify being like that. Well, what you're pointing out then is the argument is that the existence of irregularity implies that things were not created by intelligence. Because if things were created by intelligence, then everything would be regular and very artistically arranged and so forth. Well, uh, so the the point then can be made that there is a lot of regularity in the universe and one has to explain that. Uh, An intelligent creator can allow for irregularity uh, and he can also introduce regularity. But an unintelligent process may be able to produce irregularity, but how is it going to produce the regular features that are there? So there are many regular features that that can be pointed to. Uh, This corresponds to what's called the argument from design, which is uh, scientists are fond of saying that they won't even think about that nowadays. But... uh, Actually, they've introduced the argument from design through the back door, so to speak, through something that is called the anthropic principle. Uh, Many scientists have observed that there are regular features in the universe that seem necessary in order for life as we know it to exist. Uh, And these features didn't have to be that way. But if they weren't that way, then we couldn't exist. So one way to look at it is to say, well, there must be some intelligence that arranged these very uh, important regular features of the universe. 
But they have another explanation. Their explanation is that, well, um, if those features weren't there, we couldn't exist. So therefore, the fact that we exist is the, the proof that those big features must be there, that's all. And they call this the entropic principle. Uh, so, if that's a satisfying explanation, then, then you can accept that one. Actually, there are two forms of the entropic principle, the weak form and the strong form. The one I just gave is the strong form. Then the weak form of the anthropic, anthropic principle says that uh, many universes are continually forming in some kind of quantum foam. And things are happening by chance when they form. So in those universes in which by chance you get the appropriate features to allow for life, then you can have life. And there will be observers in those universes who inevitably will observe that those features are present. And in other universes in which by chance those features didn't occur, there will be no life. So those universes will never be observed. So the fact that we observe these regular features is not surprising. They have to be there. So in this way they explain the regularity. Um, but another way to explain it is to say, well, there's an intelligent designer who built in those regularities. Yeah. Someone asked me, which I couldn't answer so well, about how how is it that some um, goodness comes mind and some uh, past becomes intelligence. Do you have any insight into those? Because we think of goodness as higher, yet with, we think of intelligence as higher than mind. I think. Well, uh, the only thing that I can think of, and it's just you know speculation that tends to help things fit together is that um, the mode of passion corresponds to activity and intelligence is active in the sense that intelligence involves making decisions and so on. Uh, you can see also the senses are produced from uh, in, uh, false ego and passion and the senses that correspond to activity also, especially the working senses. So, one can at least observe that, that much. So any other questions? Yeah? And one, one other question regarding the uh, properties of the elements. So like, Earth has the property of, of smell, so, but there's like, we experience things like gases that have a, a, have a smell. So is that, are they, do they have some relationship with Earth, or is it, that when they get in your nose, they react to what's there, and then that produces some solid smell. How does that work? Well, I would presume that the gases that smell are partly made of earth, uh -huh. I would suppose, because they do have the property of smell. Besides, you may be able to condense the gas and produce the solid from it. For example, if you take carbon dioxide, that's a gas. If you can split away the ox oxygen from that, by some chemical process, you'll get carbon, which is a solid black substance. And that surely must be earth. So you're getting earth out of that gas. So, and it is explained that the elements are mixed. The elements that we experience. So, okay, one more question. Uh, like, what is like a secret? Pardon me? What is a secret? Mm-hmm. Nicholas, yeah. Yeah, we are I think in the Bible that this is wrong with the sentence for it or something. Mm-hmm. And then they just had to give them a bit of different ideas and where it's more important for their Yeah. Which sounds pretty logical and crazy. But you are wondering which sounds from the Bible and what it does. Well that brings us to the whole subject of cosmology. I won't try and go into that, but I'll mention that there's an intermediate stage uh, in the Jyotisha Shastra. Uh, in, for example, the Surya Siddhanta, the eclipse of the sun by the moon is explained uh, in the same way that scientists explain it. But Rahu is also there. Uh, briefly, uh, Rahu is defined to be the ascending node of the moon. And when there's a, uh, an eclipse, you have the sun and the moon and the ascending node lined up. So Rahu is also present there. 
But it's a long story, so I'm not going to go into that now. All there is to come. Uh, the future is always coming into being, so that's a process of creation. Uh, things are being maintained for some time, and then they're annihilated, so they go into the past and are uh, lost uh, from the point of view of those who are continuing in the present. So that's the process of annihilation. So. Uh, one of the questions that Vidura is asking Maitreya is to describe how many annihilations there are. So one of the annihilations is the annihilation that is continually occurring due to the uh, effect of material time. So uh, when Mahavishnu introduces material time into the uh, material uh, energy, the material energy begins to undergo different interactions. And as a result of this, the different elements are created. So in the uh, first step, uh, the, uh, well, actually the first step that is described is that the Pradhan becomes known as Mahatattva. Uh, within the Mahatattva, the false ego becomes activated. And within the element of false ego, these three modes of material nature begin to interact. Then it is described that from the uh, mode of goodness, the element of mind is generated. This is material mind as opposed to spiritual mind. And from the mode of passion, uh, material intelligence and the senses are generated. And from the mode of ignorance, the uh, gross material elements are generated. So, it's described that the uh, from, uh, false ego in ignorance, there's first the manifestation of sound vibration, uh, shabda. Uh, from this sound vibration, the element of ether, or space, is manifested. And ether is the accommodating room for uh, other gross material manifestations. So, uh, Ether is basically empty space. Uh, we think of space as empty, but actually, according to the uh, Vedic understanding, space is a, uh, a plenum. That is, it's full of this uh, material substance called ether, or akash. So, there's a further transformation of uh, ether. Uh, the principle of touch is introduced. This is called the Sparsha Tan Matra. So, uh, as soon as you have touch, you have the possibility of objects that can push one another or interact with one another. So, from touch, the element of air becomes manifest. Mahatyam Pralayapadi Ato Chuto Kile Loke Sa Ekas Sarva Govyaya. The devotees of the Lord never annihilate their individual existences, even after the dissolution of the entire cosmic manifestation. The Lord and the devotees who associate with him are always eternal in both the material and the spiritual world. So the translation again. Please describe how many dissolutions there are for the elements of material nature and who survives after the dissolution to serve the Lord while he is asleep. So this verse deals with the dissolution of the material creation. And of course in, Shura, in the purport, Srila Prabhupada refers to the uh, source of the material creation. So, it is explained that the material elements, uh, as we know them, are created uh, and in due course of time they are destroyed. At the same time, the material energy uh, itself is eternally existing. 
So the elements as we know them are byproducts of the eternally existing material energy. It is explained in the uh, Bhagavatam uh, that the eternal, uh, uh, eternally existing material energy uh, before the time of the creation is in a state called Pradana. Uh, in this state, uh, no variegated forms are manifest. Basically, in the uh, Pradana, you can sort of imagine a uniform uh, substance which has no variety and no uh, particular form. So, at the time of the creation, Mahavishnu glances over the material energy and he, uh, through his glance, he introduces the conditioned spirit soul who had been stored up within the body of Mahavishnu and he also injects the uh, karmic programming of those conditioned souls. Uh, and his glance also introduces the uh, element of time, or kala. So, uh, this is material time characterized by past, present, and future. So it's explained that in the spiritual world, uh, material time is not manifest. Uh, material time involves uh, three aspects, basically uh, creation, maintenance, and annihilation. So the very idea that you have past, present, and future reverses step by step. And you have the retraction of these elements one into the other. So uh, this process takes place at the time of the final annihilation of the universe. So there are different kinds of uh, annihilation. Uh, the universe is annihilated uh, at the after the complete lifetime of Brahma. So let's see what is that? It comes to some. Uh, 31 trillion years or something of that nature. One can calculate that from the figures given in the Bhagavatam. So, at the time of the annihilation of the universe, all of the different uh, material elements are retracted one into the other and one is left again with Pradhan. Uh, the conditioned spirit souls are withdrawn once again into the body of Mahavishnu. And at the time of the creation of further universes, those uh, conditioned spirit souls are again injected into the matrix of uh, the material energy. Uh, so, of course, uh, here the question is given, who survives after the dissolution? So, of course, the conditioned spirit souls survive in the sense that they exist as spirit souls, but they do not continue to have any uh, active life after the dissolution of the universe. They are stored in a state of, uh, you could say, suspended animation within the body of Mahavishnu. Uh, however, beyond the material uh, creation, there is the eternally existing spiritual world, and there are unlimited, uh, liberated living entities in the spiritual world whose lives are not interrupted by the material dissolution. So they have uh, eternal existence in the spiritual world. So there are a number of other types of dissolutions that occur within the material world. In addition to the final dissolution, there is the dissolution that occurs at the end of one kalpa, or day of Brahma. It's described that it's, uh, at the end of the day of Brahma, the planetary systems are annihilated up to, uh, I believe it's Maharaloka. Uh, this is an annihilation which involves fire and then water. Uh, then, uh, so that occurs every, at the end of every kalpa. The length of time given for a kalpa is uh, 4,320,000,000 years. So on a shorter time scale, there are dissolutions that occur at the end of a, uh, the reign of a Manu. So there are 14 uh, monitors during one kalpa. Uh, and what is it? The time period for each monitor, I think it's about 307 million years.
describe how many dissolutions there are for the elements of material nature, and who survives after the dissolution to serve the Lord while he is asleep, purport by Srila Prabhupada. In the Brahma Samhita 547-48, it is said that all the material manifestations with innumerable universes appear and disappear with the breathing of Mahavishnu lying in Yoga Nidra, or mystic sleep. Yakarna Yakara Narna Vajale Bajatisma Yoga Nidrama Namda Jagaranda Saroma Kupa Atara Shaktim Avalambya Param Sawartim Govinda Madi Purisham Tamaham Bachami Yasyai Kanishta Sikala Matavalamya Jivanti Loma Vinaja Jagaranda Nata Vishnur Mahansa Ihayasya Kamadi Shesho Govinda Madi Purusham Tamaham Bajami Govinda, the ultimate and supreme personality of Godhead, Lord Krishna, lies sleeping unlimitedly on the causal ocean in order to create unlimited numbers of universes during that sleep. He lies on the water by his own internal potency, and I worship that original supreme Godhead. Due to his breathing, innumerable universes come into existence, and when he withdraws his breath, there occurs the dissolution of all the lords of the universes. That plenary portion of the Supreme Lord is called Mahavishnu, and he is a part and parcel, and he is a part of the part of Lord Krishna. I worship Govinda, the original Lord. After the dissolution of the material manifestation, the Lord and his kingdom beyond the causal ocean do not disappear, nor do the inhabitants, the Lord's associates. The associates of the Lord are far more numerous than the living entities who have forgotten the Lord due to material association. The impersonalist explanation of the uh, word aham in the four verses of the original Bhagavatam, aham eva eva gre, etc., is refuted here. The Lord and his eternal associates remain after the dissolution. Vidura's inquiry about such persons is a clear indication of the existence of all of the paraphernalia of the Lord. This is also confirmed in the Kasi Kanda, as quoted by both Jiva Goswami and Srila Vishwanath Chakravarti, who follow in the footsteps of Srila Sridhar Swami. Uh, and the, then there's a further transformation and visual form is manifested uh, from the element of air. And then uh, light and uh, you know, fire, uh, all forms of radiant energy become manifest. Uh, so then there's a further transformation and you have the uh, sense object of uh, taste and the sense of taste. Uh, these senses, by the way, are apparently being linked in from the creation coming down from the uh, false ego in uh, the mode of passion. Because it's described that the senses are produced from false ego in passion. But we see that each gross material element links up with the sense. So you have ether being linked with uh, hearing, uh, then uh, air is linked with uh, touch, sense of touch, uh, light and radiant energy, fire, are linked up with the sense of sight. Then the uh, water, corresponding to the taste, uh, tanmatra, is linked up with the sense of taste. And then finally, there's a further transformation producing uh, aroma, or smell, and from this the element of earth is generated, and this is connected with the sense of smell. So this is the description. These elements are not uh, the elements that we directly experience in this world. It is described that uh, we do not have direct experience of the pure elements. Uh, they are to be found, for example, in the shells of the universe. But uh, within the section of the universe where everyone is living, uh, the elements are mixed in different proportions. And there are descriptions uh, in Vedic literature of the uh, uh, proportion in these mixtures. So basically, ether uh, 
is not pure ether. It is a mixture of ether and also uh, air, fire, water, and earth, but it's predominantly ether. So that element is called ether. And the same is true of the other uh, elements. So this is the process of creation. So, uh, and this takes place under the influence of the uh, time uh, element. Uh, so, uh, there is also a process of dissolution, which reverses the process of creation. So, uh, just as in the process of creation you have the production of uh, ether, air, fire, water, and earth, in the process of dissolution, you have earth being absorbed into ether, into uh, water, water into fire, fire into air, air into earth, uh, into ether, excuse me, and uh, then ether into false ego in ignorance, and so on. So everything uh, 